We never forget our boy. He was, you know, a wonderful child, and we miss him terribly. Yeah, a lot of people don't know the full gamut of what we go through, and nor should they. I, I wouldn't wish this on anyone. We'll take this pain to our grave. You can label me a monster, a cold-blooded killer, a demon child, Satan incarnate. I don't care what the name you give me. Doesn't mean that that's who I am. I can live in society and function as any other normal individual. Welcome to the Crack House Chronicles True Crime Podcast. I am Donnie, and with me is a man that feels sorry for people who only think they can drink on holidays. <laughs> it's Dale. What the hell? Yeah, that's 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 wrong. Yeah, must be like at a uh, eggnog, folks. Yeah, took me a second. <laughs> Drinking eggnog at Christmas time. Yeah, that's yeah. the only time they drink. I guess. What what other holiday drinks are there? Let me just tell you this: Dale does not need a holiday to drink. No. Mm mm. Mm mm. No, every day is a holiday for that boy. That's right. If it ends in day, it's a holiday. That's right. <laughs> what's today? <laughs> today is holiday. That's right. <laughs> ding, what's, ding, ding. What's going on, dude? What's happening, my friend? Hey, I'm ready to record. What you doing? I'm ready to do the same. Be- a good day today. It's been nice outside. It's been a good day. Yes, sir. It's been a real good day. Now, I'm ready to get in the, in the crack house here and lay her down, man. Well, that's it. You got any good shout-outs? Anybody want to talk about before we get going? Yeah, hey, I got a few mentions here and there. What mentions? Yeah, we got to do some mentions. You know who we haven't mentioned lately? Who? Bizarre Nate. I know, man. So, there you go. Bizarre Nate, that's for you. Yeah, but I was Bizarre Nate. Okay. I did uh, see your Instagram post where you were in the cave rock and roll, and that was pretty cool, you and Jam. So, oh. live it up, brother. That's it. All right, man. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Kim Connor. She uh, shot us a message and said that she lived down near the Sundrop Bottling Plant down in Concord, and that was uh, uh, an episode we did back, it's been a while since, like episode 46, and basically they lived near the area, and they oh, everybody around there kind of thought it was gang-related, so... She just wanted to give us a shout out, said thanks for keeping that in the public eye, and uh, she really appreciate the show. Well, Kim, we appreciate you listening. That's right. Heck yeah. I know. Uh, I'd like to uh, give a little thanks to Denise for the email she sent. We we love the input, and any of you guys want to send us an email or a suggestion or a comment or anything, we, we appreciate all of them that you send. You can go to the, the website and leave a message through there, or you can mail us directly at Crackhouse Chronicles at gmail.com. Or you can leave uh, something on uh, the page or the fan page or the Facebook fan page. There's many ways to contact us. Yeah. And speaking of the fan page, we also want to thank everybody for uh, jumping over there and joining up on the face page. Yep. The face page. The face Facebook fan page. The Facebook fan page. Say that three times real fast. That three times real fast. There you go. You done it. Yeah. That's what I'm say. If I keep talking like this, I'm just going to sit up here and watch you and drink this beer. Hey, drink that beer, boy. <laughs> anyway. anyway, one more word. I want to give a shout out to uh, Mike Winnipeg, man. We appreciate you hitting us up yesterday and tagging me in the post and with, uh, with the news of the, the DNA results that found out today that Jean Leroy Hart was indeed the killer of the Girl Scout and the Girl Scout murders. And uh, we covered that back on episode 86. And that's uh, in the archives. You jump back and catch that. But we knew it the whole time, didn't we? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just, pretty pretty much knew, knew that all the way, all he, the time. He got his flashlight and his horn rim glasses, and he was ready to go. Yeah, that's right. Living in the cave. Yeah, that's some scary stuff. But I'm glad to. I mean, he's deceased, so it really it's kind of moot point. But at least they know it was him for sure. Exactly. Yeah. And we we'll mind everybody to go to Apple Podcast and rate and review. Click that five star and write something in the box. We appreciate it. Yeah, it don't have to be something. It has to be a few words. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Give us some kind words. Yeah. And so we're going over to the store page and order you something. Yeah, I'll get you something. Order you a t-shirt or something. Get your tank top. Yeah. It is becoming a little warm out. Yeah. Get you a tank top. <laughs> get you a mug. Get you some kind of, get you a sticker or something. Yeah. We get some cool stickers. Yep. But that's all I got. All right, then. All right. We are going to get into our, our episode, dude, this week. And I'm going to tell you, we've <laughs> we hit another one that's pretty rough. Mm, you think so? Yeah. We've covered a lot of stuff, a lot of different things, but... We're just going to get into this one and, and jump in. and. Yeah, when you said it was going to be like a child killer this week, I thought it was going to do like Michael Myers or something. No, but this is a little bit different. Yeah, definitely. We've done a lot of serial killers, a lot of people who've killed kids and things, but never a kid who's killed a kid. Right. So this is what we're going to talk about today. All right, then. But this takes place back in 1992, August of 1992. And it starts out... At the home of Dale and Doreen Robbie. Not me. 
they lived in Savona, New York. It's a small village town in New York. Right? Yeah, I think yeah. they had a population of about 900. Yeah, it wasn't many. No, it's a very, very small town, village, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, that sounds weird to me, but I guess that's what they call it. Yeah, whatever. village up there. I don't live there, so. I don't live in a village. <laughs> but It takes a village, you know. You would think that everybody <laughs> living there would know everyone. Oh, I, I would. yeah, I would think so. Or have seen somebody yeah. there at one time or another. If you sit on the porch long enough, everybody's come by. Pretty much, you'd think. Yeah. Yep. But like I said, this takes place with uh, starting out with Dale and Doreen Robbie in their home. This was on August 2nd of 1993. Mm-hmm. And Doreen, she was having trouble with the smaller boys. She had two boys. Yep. D- Derek and Dalton. Derek was four and Dalton was 18 months. Yeah. But, it's time. But Derek was almost five. He was getting pretty close to five knocking on the door yeah okay but she was having trouble with dalton that morning he was being fussy and just wasn't cooperating at all right we all had them days but Derek was supposed to be going to a day camp Mm -hmm. it was right down the street and doreen had been taking him every morning but this like i said this morning dalton was giving her a fit yep wouldn't cooperate and crying just was not satisfied at all and Derek, he had told his mom that he can go himself yeah Walk by himself. Right. Like I said, it was just a block away on the same street. It, it was a dead end road too, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, and it was on the same side of the street as their house. He so. wouldn't have to cross the street or anything. Right, just right down. Yeah. Just listen a block away, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. So she decided to let him go. Whew. Yeah. It was the first time she ever decided to let him go anywhere by herself. Which, you know, we first started talking about this and you know, it was like, Well, he said he was four years old and went by himself. I was flipping out, but you know, when you think about it, you know, it's in the nineties, which you know, it's still the nineties, but you know, it just wasn't real far. Mm-hmm. You know, less than a block, so it, you know, it's a little bit more understandable. Yeah, but she kissed her son goodbye and waved bye to him, and he headed out. Yep, and told his mom he loved her. Yep, and was gone. And was gone. And but she watched him as far as she could see him mm-hmm. going up the street, and on his way there, he crossed paths with a another kid. Yep. A 13 year old boy named Eric Smith. Right. Now, Eric Smith, he was on his way back from the day camp. He had been sent home for bad behavior. Hmm. So, we're going to talk a little bit about Eric Smith right now. Okay. Now, Eric Smith, he was born on January the 22nd, 1980, in Steuben County, New York. Now, Eric lived with his mom and his stepdad. Right. And his stepdad was kind of rough on him. I mean, he wasn't a really abusive, I don't think, like most stepdads we've talked about. Right. But still bad enough. Yeah. Well, you know, he said himself, you know, he had sort of a temper and stuff. And, you know, and Eric was, he was kind of a loner. He, you know, he had been bullied a lot in school. He had, he had glasses and real fire red hair and freckles and you know, and said his, his ears were kind of big. So he was a perfect target for being bullied all the time. And I um, said, you know, most of the time he would come home, even off the bus, he'd be crying about it every day because somebody would be on his butt. Just and, by the way he looked. Yeah, just, just catching, catching hell for basically the way he looked. You know, you know how bullies are. They're going to find something and just pick on you. Yeah. But, you know, day after day after day after day, it gets a little old, you know. And I'm sure, you know, he came home a lot whining about it, you know. And, you know, who knows what's going on at home, you know, but I'm sure he, he didn't want to, the stepdad probably didn't want to hear it every day, basically telling him, you know, well, when I got to feeling that bad, I'd just go out and punch the workout bag till I was tired, you know, and this kind of stuff. And even when he come in and asked for help, going, you know, I really want to hurt somebody. I need to do something. That's, that was his advice to him. Yeah. So it wasn't, it wasn't a whole lot of parenting going on there, I don't think, But in my opinion. Eric, he, you know, he wore Jeffrey Dahmer glasses. Yeah. And uh, he, <laughs> yeah, he, he did, and uh, he his his ears set real low on his head. They attribute a lot of this to his mom, because when his mom was pregnant with him, she took some medication that helped with her uh, seizures, seizures yeah. and um, epileptic seizures and stuff, right. which uh, they don't allow him to take now. But they claim that that caused some minor birth defects, maybe. Right. So that's what they... That's what they're blaming on anyway. Yeah. But in school, Derek, he he played in the band. He right. played, played trombone. He wrestled. And he loved spending time with his grandparents. Mm-hmm. And his grandparents were Red and Edie Wilson. 
and they even said when he would come in they would give him hugs and kisses and um eric just liked being a clown yeah well you know you know like i said you know he's catching a lot of a lot of flack on the bus and stuff and that's pretty much the way it was while i remember going to school too you know and that's why i think that a lot of people had a different account of him when they would see him at school he was, you know, cracking jokes. He was in the uh, the band. I think he played trombone, maybe. Yeah, he did play trombone. Yeah. And I think he was on the wrestling team. So, you know, people, that's why, you know, a lot of research is like, well, was he like this or was he like that? Well, it could be both. You know, at school, we could be a whole different person than by the time he got off the bus. Cause yeah. Basically, the bus is where you can catch because, you know, they're all different ages of folks on the bus. And, you know, usually at school, you're pretty much with your same group of friends or same group of folks every day. And the bus is a little bit different. Well, you're on the bus at the end of the day, and you, kids are letting their hair down, and they're just ready to get home, and they're, you know. And if you're the target, then everybody's going to jump in because it's funny, you know, and that seems like the cool thing to do, but it's not. But uh, Eric was the target. He was. I mean, they, whenever he people saw him around town, he was always by himself, riding his BMX bike by himself. Yep. He didn't have any friends or any close friends that he hung out with at all. Right. It was either his mom and dad, his his siblings, or his grandparents. grandparents. Now, Eric did have two sisters. He was the middle child between two sisters. And I don't hear much about the older no. sister. Mm -mm. But uh, I have heard a little bit about the younger sister. So we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Right. Now, when Eric Smith crossed paths with Derek Roby, Eric had told derek that he knew a quicker way to the day camp and he had him follow him through the woods mm -hmm. and when he got him in the woods this is when eric got behind him and started choking him yep strangling strangling him mm -hmm. now derek started fighting him a little bit and he was a lot smaller than him but he started fighting him and he was able to get derek on the ground at this point while he was choking him right and well, you know, if he was on the wrestling team, he, you know, he was had a little strength himself and was able to maneuver him down, probably just to slam him on the ground. Yeah. And once he had him on the ground, Eric was, he managed to find a rock. Yeah. And at this point, he picked the rock up and was hitting Derek in the head with the rock. Yeah. And then he found a 26 pound rock. Yeah. I think he had to dig it out of the ground a little bit. So I'm sure after the first those other rock, he probably had him pretty much laying there out and then he dug up the big rock yeah and that's when he smashed his head yeah yeah pretty pretty bad yeah pretty bad bludgeoning mm -hmm. yeah after he dropped the large rock on his head he undressed him mm. and he pulled his pants down and then he that's when he, eric found a a stick a stick yeah. and he sodomized him with the stick yeah 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 pretty bad stuff yeah it it's, doesn't make a lot of sense to me what the hell? Mm -hmm. But they determined the cause of death to be the blunt trauma to the head with contributing asphyxia. Yeah. And this was when Eric went through Derek's lunchbox. Mm -hmm. And he found uh, a banana and some Kool-Aid. Mm -hmm. And he threw the banana down and smashed it. Yeah. And then he opened the Kool-Aid and poured the Kool-Aid into the wounds. What the hell, dude? I know bad stuff you know and all this is basically five minutes after he left his house yeah five yeah. minutes yeah and only what a couple hundred yards from his front door mm -hmm. mm. and eric left mm -hmm. but get this deal he just went on about his his regular day yeah but he went back to Derek's body twice that morning mm -hmm. twice he yeah, went back one time and then like took his right shoe and put it by his left hand and took his left shoe and put it by his right hand. It's almost like he was staging the body. Yeah, and kind of put him with his hands out to his side. It's weird. Mm -hmm. weird. Yeah. It's like he did. I guess he didn't want the moment to end, so he had to keep going back. Yeah. He was enjoying it. He was. Mm hmm So he was up getting up close to about 11 o'clock that morning, and there was a storm coming up. And to talk about this storm, Derek's mom, Doreen, she got concerned about this storm and wanted to go get Derek at the day camp. Mm -hmm. And when she got there, they said uh, he had never shown up. Right. He didn't ever make it. Mm -mm, never did. And that's when they got people looking for Derek. Right. 
Yeah, and after about four hours of searching the town, they finally found him. Yeah. But Derek's body was found in a small patch of woods, and it was halfway between the park where he was headed and his home. And evidence showed that Derek was lured from the sidewalk and strangled. But by the time all this happened, nobody knew who the killer was. They right. People were thinking that it, a stranger in their town that had come in and yeah. killed him. Yeah, because, you know, like I said, pretty much everybody knew everybody. Mm-hmm. They just thought it was some adult. They could definitely even, thought it was an adult. Yeah. Yeah. But they were looking all over town to try to find who had killed Derek Roby. Mm-hmm. And Eric Smith, he had even went to the police station to try to help with the investigation, sur- yeah, the, investigation the search. Yeah. And they were asking him questions, you know, and he admitted to seeing Derek that morning. Yeah, that's it. They said that, you know, when he first went in, they were asking him questions that, like he was really enjoying being part of it, you know, and then. As he talked to him more and more, that's when he said that he'd actually seen him from across the field. Yeah. And they're like, jaws dropped when, that, when he said that. I was like, wait a minute, you saw him. And it, the time he gave that he saw him was like five minutes from the time the coroner said that he did it, so it didn't look good. He was describing Derek down to a T, the, the clothes he was wearing, the his lunch box. Yeah. Or lunch bag, or whatever he was carrying. Yeah, he even said it was a cool lunch box. Yeah. So he had to, they were thinking he they had to see him close up. Yeah, so they took him back out and got on his bike and told him to go where he was mm-hmm. and then show him. And they determined there was no way he could have, he could have seen that detail from where he was. Mm-hmm. And they got to have, interrogating him a little bit more. They were really concerned about this kid. And they got to asking him questions. And that's when he started flipping out a little bit, started clenching up his fist and shaking and kind of like what he did before when he's mad. And then uh, he said, you guys think I did it, don't you? You think I killed him. You think I killed him. Mm-hmm. And then they'd done some more stuff and brought him in some Kool-Aid, some red Kool-Aid. And they'd already knew about the, the wound stuff. And mm-hmm. he just grabbed it and threw it on the floor. Yeah. And that's what he told him. He said, I, I, I haven't killed anyone, and I, I've never sexually assaulted anyone. Mm. Yeah, they, didn't, they hadn't even mentioned the sexual assault. Oh, shit. Yeah. I'd heard one officer even said that the hair stood on the back of his neck. I bet so. Yeah. Freaking out all this time, they're thinking they're looking for an adult, and they're sitting here talking to the killer the whole time. Mm Mm-hmm. Crazy. But now, Eric Smith's grandfather, Red Wilson, he said the family knew that Eric was hiding something. Right. And they think they thought that he was maybe he had maybe seen something and was threatened. Yeah. And yeah. You know, threatened. Don't you tell nobody in this. Thought he was just basically hiding what he knew because he didn't want to get in trouble mm-hmm. from somebody else but they couldn't figure it out they was, they was trying to help figure out what was going on with eric yeah so they finally just come on man you gotta tell us what's going on and eric would even ask them what would happen if it turned out to be a kid hmm. and the grandpa said i seriously think they would need some psychiatric help he said oh okay and then he walked away that's crazy man it is mm-hmm but now the details, they begin to leak out about the crime. And there was a lady named Marlene Heskel. She launched her own investigation into this murder. And she went to the store and she bought, like, ice cream, nuts, syrup, and bananas. And she brought it home and asked everyone if they wanted Sundays. And they all did. And Eric was going to have nuts and syrup, but he didn't want a banana. He didn't like bananas. mm no, and that's that's even when Marlene said that she got scared. Yeah, since he just smashed a banana in the field. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But now just a little bit more on Eric. He had been known to throw tantrums and fits of rage, and he would even bang his head on the floor. Right. A lot. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of them, and if I don't get my way, I fall on the floor and smash my head on the floor. Mm-hmm. Mm, yeah. Yeah, but you know they saying they don't know if you know how how severe it was if it was like giving himself many concussions or whatever. But you know, just sounded like he needed some little, he needed some parenting, I think, uh, or maybe just some attention. I don't know, but it was it's just not right. No, it's not. But now, just five days after the murder, Derek Roby he was buried in his baseball uniform. Yep. Yeah, he loved baseball and he loved soccer. And yeah, his daddy was a t-ball coach, and he just loved the t-ball stuff. Yep. It was his favorite thing. And just two days after the funeral, Eric Smith confessed to killing Derek Roby. 
Yeah, they finally talked to him again and told him they need to tell him what he knew. And this when they told him he was sorry, but he killed that kid. Mm-hmm. Wow. Red Wilson, his grandfather, said it's still hard to believe about his grandson. Mm-hmm. Something must have happened to him because that wasn't my grandson. Crazy. Yeah. He just said basically when they asked him why he did it, he said he really didn't know. He just saw that blonde kid and he wanted to hurt him. He just wanted to hurt him. Now, a little background on on Derek. You know, even though he was four, he was basically he was basically the honorary mayor of the town. That he was always on the corner on his bike, waving at everybody going by. He wanted to be everybody's friend. He was just like the most, I would say, most probably the most popular kid around. Mm-hmm. The way the way it's been told to me. He's and, a very cute kid. Yeah, and everything was going his way, and everything was great. Mm-hmm. And meanwhile, and that's what it hit me today when. I was doing some research on this, and I kept hearing this stuff, you know, and I really hadn't never put it together, and then I'm like, wow, wait a minute. What if this is the reason that Eric lost it? You know, he and then you told me that, uh, you know, he'd just been sent home for bad behavior from the same place that... Uh, the day camp. The day camp where he was going. Do you think that... Uh, when he locked eyes with him, he knew he was Mr. Popular, Mr. Goody Goody, yeah. Mr everybody's buddy and I'm mr mayor and, yeah and i'm i'm nobody and i'll yeah. never be anybody and because that's basically what you know his stepdad always said you know he'd come on he'd say that you know he was nobody he'll never be anybody just because he had been told that so much and been put down so much he, was bur- he basically had no self-esteem at all mm-hmm. you know and, and you just think you know after anger and rage maybe it just snapped him could have because i'm thinking wow you know that just that because you know it's it was really weird. I don't think they, they didn't really know each other. And I, I think maybe Eric probably knew who he was, who Derek was, just from the way everybody said it. he knew everybody in the town and the way, you know, the way he acted. But I'm sure that uh, Derek didn't know Eric. Mm-hmm. But once they were in, you know, and he was friendly to everybody. He, he wanted to be friends with everybody, so he wouldn't think nothing out of the ordinary when he invited him to walk off with him. Mm-hmm. And then he just took advantage of him. And, you know, I think, you know, even I think that uh, Eric had already been hurting animals and doing basically the stuff that we always see in, that's in the timeline of serial killers. You know, it was basically, uh, you know, headed that way, it seems. And then he goes to, to camp to try to be cool with all the other kids, and they send him home, and then he runs across Mr. Mayor. Mm-hmm. I, I really think that, that had something to do with it, why he picked him. I think so, too. It was it's very possible, but now Eric did he he fit into that McDonald triad that trifecta of three traits that's pretty much coined by forensic psychiatrists, and you know him setting fires, cruelty to animals. He would he would uh, shoot dogs and cats with BB guns mm-hmm. and uh, drown birds, and he would even wet the bed. All kind of mess. So he had those traits of. Um, problematic yeah stuff, but, you know. some serial killers have yes and then eric even had speech problems and they it's even been reported that he became attracted to girls by the age of four and he became a heavy smoker by the age of nine wow and he had a uh, like a speech problem too he'd, he would drool when he spit when he would speak right so it, he had some stuff going on right it's really sad really mm-hmm and Eric was um, in the fifth grade at this time, but he had been held back in the fourth grade. So he spent two years in the fourth grade. So he was a little bit older than the kids in his class. Right. So he probably had to be bullied for that, too. Yeah, well, I'm sure. Yeah. So he, everything that Eric had was going against him, Dale. Yeah. You know, and he wasn't getting any help at home. Because, like you said, he would go to his stepfather about what he what he needed to do. Yeah. You know, and basically, and his mom just basically told him he needed to stand up for himself. Yeah. Well, you know, that's all, it's all great, you know. But, I mean, if he was on the wrestling team, you know, I could see he could do a little bit, you know, whatever. I'm, I mean, but I don't know. That just does not very good advice. I, I think they just, their parenting skills are just trash, if you ask me. Yeah. Because they really didn't, even... Even the stepdad, you know, said he come to him and told him he needed some help. He knew what to do and this kind of stuff, and they just kind of blew him off. I don't, I don't know that that would have made a, a huge amount of difference, but it damn sure, sure couldn't have hurt. No. Give the boy some time, you know. 
Mm -hmm, I agree. But this um, murder case made national headlines. Mm -hmm. It was largely due to the killer's age. He was 13, and Derek Roby, he was four. Right. And in New York, you know, that's the only um, charge that they can charge a juvenile, like a 13-year-old, with, you know, as an adult. I know. I'm sure it's getting, you know, a lot of attention for that. But Eric Smith was subjected to extensive medical testing from specialists on both sides. Mm -hmm. They examined his brain function, hormone levels, and found nothing to explain his violent and aggressive behavior. Right. And uh, according to court documents, Eric Smith was a loner and was often tormented by bullies, like we said, for mm -hmm. his protruding low-set ears, thick glasses, red hair, and freckles. And his glasses were really big, too, so that didn't help him either. Jeffrey Dahmer glasses. Yeah. You know, and, and even when, you know, going through all this stuff and checking out his, his mental his mental problems and stuff and because of the sexual nature of his crimes with that stick you know the question come up you know whether he was abused or not but it did come out that uh his older sister stacy you know was sexually abused by their stepfather mm -hmm. even though there's no evidence that eric was actually you know was abused who knows if he was or not you know he basically told you know everybody he you know he never if it did it never came out that it was there but he definitely did with the, the daughter yeah so i don't know because and they said, you know, when the reasoning he gave for using that stick was he thought he could r ram it in there far enough to hit his heart and make it stop. Yeah. But I don't know if I buy that or not. That's kind of far-fetched. He got Derek Roby into the woods. He was wanting to beat that kid up, I think. Yeah. And it went too far. He was wanting to hurt him. Oh, he hurt him. And, yeah, oh, he hurt him bad. I can't imagine what. How much damage a 26-pound rock, I mean, that's... Just the drop of it alone, plus the force yeah, uh, coming down. Fury. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that, that would be awful. That's enough to crush anybody's skull. Yeah. Yeah. Especially a little small little fellow like him. Yeah. Four-year-old. But now on August the 16th of 1994, this was a little over a year later. Eric Smith was convicted of second-degree murder mm -hmm. and sentenced to the maximum term then available for juvenile murderers. Yeah, nine years to life. Yeah. That's a big gap. Mm hmm But while he was in jail, Eric Smith read out an apology to the Roby family on public television. And it said, I know my actions have caused terrible loss in the Roby family, and for that I am truly sorry. I've tried... To think as much as, as possible about Derek will never experience. His 16th birthday, Christmases, anytime owning his own house, graduating, going to college, getting married, his first child. If I could go back in time, I would switch places with Derek and endure the pain I have caused him. Mm. If it meant that he would go on living, I'd switch places. But I can't. And at the end of this statement, Eric Smith states that he cannot bear the thoughts of walls, razor wire and steel metal bars for the rest of his life he has also apologized to Derek Roby in interviews hmm. yeah but Eric Smith was held in a juvenile facility for three years and then transferred to an open prison for young adults and in 2001 he was transferred to the Clinton Correctional Facility in Dannemora New York yeah I and mean, since he was it was nine years to life He's definitely eligible for parole. Like, After nine years, yeah. Yeah. And he would go up for parole every two years. Right. After that. Which basically means that Dale and Doreen would have to relive this every two years. Every two years. You know, and they said a lot of times they weren't, they said that, you know, they wasn't able to go into the actual hearing, so they would make homemade and home movies and stuff like that to send to the board to yeah. make sure they knew what they had lost. Yeah. And they did this for Derek. Yep. Uh, years after years after years. Every two years. Every two years. Mm -hmm. And they would get a letter from the parole board right around Christmas time. Yeah, Merry that, Christmas. Yeah. And that have that hanging over your head over the holidays, man. Right. Yeah, that suck. Can you even imagine? It's hard enough you're missing them, and then you get that letter that you have to go and try to try to keep the killer in prison. Mm -hmm. you know, it's crazy. Yep. And as of May 3rd, 2016, the New York State Department of Corrections website showed him incarcerated at Collins Correctional Facility. 
and it's a medium security prison for male inmates in Erie County, New York. And on April the 26th of 2019, he was listed as incarcerated in Gowanda Correctional Facility. And it's a medium security prison, which is co-located in Collins Correctional Facility. Hmm. And get this. On November the 30th, 2019, he was listed as incarcerated at the Woodburn Correctional Facility in Sullivan County. So he was moved around quite a bit. Right. But Smith had been denied parole 10 times since 2002, most recently in January of 2020. And after the failed 2012 hearing, the the parole board cited a concern for public safety in his decision, and Dale and Doreen, they opposed his release. And at that hearing, he told the parole board he would not return to Sabona if released and would go to a shelter or halfway house instead. Yeah, I, don't, I wouldn't think you'd want to go back there. No, uh uh-uh. And you know, if I was Derek's dad, you damn sure wouldn't want to come back there. You, I wouldn't want to see your face in that town again. No. Mm-mm. Now, in October of 2021, this was just last October, mm-hmm. Eric Smith was granted parole after 27 years of incarceration. He was raised by the prison system. Yeah. Yeah. And he was scheduled to be released on November 17th. 2021 but his release was delayed because he did not have proper a, housing yeah yeah and i think you said that uh they finally found him somewhere in queens new york which is like 200 miles away from this place yeah yeah from savona new york right but he was ultimately released from prison on february the 1st of 2022 this year crazy and they'd asked eric you know what he wanted to do with his life what he wanted to do and he claimed that he had met someone, he had met a woman. He had a fiancé. Yeah, and she was studying to be a lawyer. Yeah, I think she uh, uh, had contacted him on stuff about, you know, the the psychology part of the children and all this stuff. And basically just interviewing him, and then they fell in love. Talking about the juvenile justice system, I right. think. Right, all that, yeah. But he claimed that he wanted to get a job, and he wanted to... He wanted to help bully children. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's, that's a good thing, I guess. But it's honorable, but, you know, that's just something to say. It sounds like to me that's something to say to get out of jail. Yeah. I mean, you know, if he does it, fine. If not, whatever. I don't know. But but he said he wanted to get married and have a kid and get a job and have the American dream, pretty yeah. much, what he said. Right. Decent. Just like every other decent person. is like, wait a damn minute. I don't think you're the decent person here, dude. Yeah. But, you know... It, I don't. I don't know how I feel about this. I think it's not my kid. But and, and he basically served thirty years. He was yeah. a kid when he done it. So I, I don't know. But also, he got to look at the background of you know the stuff he did. You know, was basically gearing up. He was escalating. And he, yeah, and definitely. And then I think in the when he was fifteen, one no, I guess it couldn't. Well, I don't know. It was it was fairly soon after. I think a couple of years after he was convicted. They had went in and was doing another psych thing on him and asked him, you know, what did he feel, you know, did you feel good when he did it? And he said, yeah, at the time he did when he mm-hmm. committed it. And they said, well, if you weren't, weren't caught, you know, what are the chances of, that you would do it again? And he said, oh, I would do it again. Yeah. And that was, now that was early on. He enjoyed doing it. Yes. Because that's why he went back to the body two more times. Yeah. He didn't want that to end. Basically, it was, the feeling was, this time it's not me getting hurt. I get to be the one yeah. giving up, giving out the pain. I get know? to lash it out, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and it said, and the the Roby family and the Smith family have not exchanged a single word in all these years, even though they still live in the same town. Yeah, they, right. they found themselves face to face, but they never spoke. I can't even imagine. Wow. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, and Dale Roby said, you know, well, we can't live here. So I actually, I live on Roby Road. You know, they had moved. Uh, not long after that happened, basically to leave, to a house that didn't have so many memories of Derek, you know, especially for Dalton, you know, to help him. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's pretty wild that these, you know, basically, Ruby Rose is where all his family lives. So you know, they they wouldn't want to leave their support system. Basically, what he was saying. Yeah. But you know, it's it's crazy now. Years later, to honor Derek, volunteers bulldozed the scene of the crime and put in a new ball field. Yeah. In memory of him, and actually erected a little statue of Derek. And we'll post some pictures of that. Yeah, Yeah. it's pretty cool. But now it is reported that 
Eric Smith's grandfather, Red, he helped with that uh, ball field and helped, right. helped grade to make that happen. Right. You know, we, we talked about a little bit about that today. You know, what what would you do? I'm like, I'm like well, you really can't blame them, man. You know, especially the grandparents. Yeah. I'm sure they've done all they can do. You know how grandparents, are, you know, they're going to love him to death, you know, when he comes over there. You know, and there's some little video clips of him here and there where you can hear him talking to him and stuff. And it's just like a regular kid. You mm-hmm. know, and I'm sure he wasn't getting the, the I don't know, I don't want to trash his parents too much, too much more anyway. But I'm sure he was getting a lot better care at the grandparents than he was at home. Or sure it seems like it. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I've, I've thought about this hard and heavy. And I don't know how, you know, as far as the Robies being a parent, I wouldn't want him to be out, but they don't have to face this parole board every two years now. Right. It was kind of like, I mean, I know it's it's difficult, but basically you're out, you're out of prison too. Because before they were just chained to this thing that they knew they were going to get every two years. Yeah, this letter came every two years. And you get it and it's over and you're like, Phew, and then you go, well, let's go ahead and start preparing for the next one. Because, mm-hmm. you know, it's just something you would dread. And now you can just kind of going with your life you know you still have another son mm-hmm. i mean you're not you're not forgetting Derek, but you still you got to live for your other son too you know who's now what 30 30 years old yeah married with some kids i think so yeah so you know i mean i don't know i don't know either man but it's just i've heard uh an interview with Derek's mom and she said it is a relief knowing you don't have to go to the parole board anymore you can start living your life and right. moving forward a little bit well you know i'm sorry i went to cut you off but that's all right like i said before you know i think she was kind of tired of fighting the fight you know and and dale would remind her that we we have to do it for Derek. well you know now it's over we can let Derek go you know a little bit and then we can live our life mm-hmm. and i think that's basically what you're trying to say yeah you know it's just because before that's all you think about yeah you know mm-hmm and it's kind of like, you know, they have an inscription on the statue, basically. It was a, dedicated to be a gentle reminder of what childhood is meant to be, which I thought was really cool. Yeah. You know, and just everybody can go back to being carefree and kids and stuff, you know. And um, But uh, I'm sure Eric Smith surely changed the damn lay of the land in this place. Went, yeah. went from everybody knows each other to nobody caring about a, nothing with a, not a care in the world to holy shit what just happened i know now, i've heard Derek roby's dad say that when they're out and it's Derek's birthday they always go and get white ice cream and sprinkles because yeah. that was his favorite yeah that's what he called it vanilla we want white ice cream with sprinkles yep you know and then they said it didn't matter where they were or, you know if they were on vacation or whatever they had to go search out some white ice cream and yeah. i thought that was cool so yeah they still do things to remember Derek. yeah and um i've heard an interview with dalton that was a younger brother that was two at the time and, you know, he don't remember his brother, but he's seen videos, and he always wonders what it would be like to have that best friend to talk to and do things with. And Yeah, you know, I was thinking today, man, I wonder if he ever really gets depressed about thinking, you know, I mean, I know he was just a baby, and it's all different, but if he wouldn't have been pitching a fit that day. Yeah, he can't control his actions. He was a baby. Right. You know, 18 months old. And I'm sure his, that, that day haunts his mom, mm-hmm. you know, because... That was the first time she ever let him go by himself. And how many times has that happened? First yeah. time. I can't imagine what this family goes through, man. Right. You can't. They can't blame themselves. They cannot. No. Definitely not. Mm-mm. But they're they're a strong family. I mean, they they held it together and they did everything they could for. Yeah, because this that could have easily exploded a family. You know. They could have. You know, they could have been playing the blame game, like you said, but they decided to rally around each other and, and do it for Derek. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what I would have done, but yeah, they they held it together. I I commend them yeah. greatly. Yeah, sure do. But Eric Smith is out. He is out on parole. I'm sure he has to check into a probie officer regularly for a certain amount of time. Yeah. So it's a gamble, man. We let him out. Right. Well, you know, like you said. Yeah, I'm sure he's a different person, but like you said, he's also been raised in prison, so. Yeah. You know, if he if he can get out and, and get on the right track, I'm sure he, he don't want to go back. I mean, he's spent his whole life there. That's true. Yeah. You know? Yeah. All right, that is 
the case of Eric Smith and the story of Derek Derek Roby. Derek Roby. All right. All right, Dale, we're going to get out of here. All right, man, let's roll. We want everyone to be safe, be careful, and always be aware of your surroundings. Because the next episode could be about you. This is The The Crack Crack House House Chronicles. Chronicles.